Welcome back to my top 20 games of the past decade. If you haven't seen the previous video, link is in the description. You know the drill, these are my personal favorite games of the past decade, where the popularity of these titles isn't taking into account. Let's not waste any more time and jump right in. Number 10. A Hat in Time an indie game that brought back the collect-a-ton platforming, popularized by the likes of Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. While there are plenty of other titles that did this too, A Hat in Time had such wonderful charm to it that it became my favorite of the bunch. It picks quality over quantity to create a short experience, but it's immensely engaging all the way through. From the comedic characters, how each mission has a clever story added to it, epic boss battles, catchy as hell music, and the tight controls. This platformer has it all. Every mission felt like a little adventure and I always wanted to see what it would offer next. The PC version is the only version that includes the Yakuza Metro DLC and fun modded stages. In that regard, I'd highly recommend to play it on PC, if you want to try it out yourself, in order to get the total package. A good example of why a Kickstarter game project can be really awesome if it's put in the right hands, and I hope it encourages other talented creators to let themselves be heard too. Number 9. Kingdom Hearts 3 When I was a kid, the original two Kingdom Hearts games were unique experiences where you could travel through iconic Disney worlds and fight side by side with famous characters. Now that I'm older, I realize just how empty and lifeless the worlds actually are, how downplayed the iconic Disney scenes are and how cheesy the dialogue is. I still love them for their own reasons, but the aspect that originally drew me to them faded as I grew older. But Kingdom Hearts 3 somehow managed to turn off the critical view of an adult and bring back the childlike feeling of wonder I experienced all those years ago. It offers by far the most faithful representation of the Disney movies Kingdom Hearts ever did, with gorgeous worlds that are awesome to explore. Sailing on the seas with Jack Sparrow, taking on the Titans with Hercules, exploring the Monsters Incorporated factory with Sully and Mike, it's a huge nostalgia rush in the best way possible. Kingdom Hearts 3 has butter smooth controls and a very satisfying combat system, plenty of creative enemies and bosses epic music and beautiful graphics. Yes, the difficulty is too low. Yes, the dialogues are still very cheesy. Yes, I hated the ending for how drawn out and confusing it was. And they should have removed the reminder when ingredients are found. Shut up! But they never took away of the things I love about it. This was a fantastic entry in the Kingdom Hearts series that, despite its crappy ending and low difficulty, I had an awesome time with and I'm eager to see what the future will bring. Maybe there will finally be a boss fight against Gaston? Number 8. Astrobot Rescue Mission I feel like I might overglorify Astrobot at this point, but for a good reason. This is a simple yet very effective platform game that's oozing with charm in every aspect, from the cute characters, colorful level design, tight controls, overall mechanics, awesome bosses, catchy music, it's just so much fun. It's not a platform game where they added VR compatibility at the very end in an attempt to make it stand out between the other platform titles, but it's made from the ground up with VR in mind, making the platforming and VR go hand in hand seamlessly. Will this type of game be done better in the future? Maybe, though I haven't seen any plans for similar titles or a sequel. Make them happen, Sony. You got my pre-order. Number 7. Heavy Rain The game that started it all. While Heavy Rain has notably more flaws than most other games I've mentioned, the things it does right and what it meant at the time it came out still make it one of my favorite games of the past decade. Even though it's the first in the interactive drama genre, it still does a couple of things better than most future entries, like how you can actually select the difficulty for the quick time events, making it more challenging. There are also a large amount of ways the story can end. There are entire levels or fights you can miss, making a second playthrough recommended to see some cool stuff you might have missed. The main focuses are on the story and the cinematic feel of it all. These hold up very well. The mystery regarding the child kidnapper is chilling, the characters are well developed, 
The compositions are artistic and the music has this beautiful, bittersweet ring to it. It's easily one of the most somber games I've ever played, but in a way, that made me feel for the characters and I wanted them to turn out fine. Like I said, the game has some notable flaws. There are way too much quick time events and they use it for freaking everything. If you've already played the game, discovering the clues again isn't that fascinating since you already know what's important and what is not important. But since it's the first in its genre, I can overlook most of these flaws. I've played the game around 7 times now and I still feel excited to try new stuff or just re-experiencing the story. Since some scenes are really hard to reach, maybe now would be the time to finally pick up that guide I've been telling myself to pick up for years. Number 6. Life is Strange While not as visually appealing as supermassive or quantic dream games due to the significantly lower budget, Life is Strange completely won me over with its writing. The story focuses on Max, a girl who returns to her birth town Arcadia Bay to study photography. But when an old friend of hers gets shot, she suddenly gains the ability to reverse time. With this gift, she prevents the shooting from taking place. From that point on, it's an engaging trip of building friendship, dealing with dramas of the past, uncovering mysteries of the town, or just exploring everything that Arcadia Bay has to offer. The bond Max builds up with her old friend Chloe feels very genuine. It's not a black and white friendship where everything is happy and good. If anything, Chloe is a troubled person who often does rather unlikable things. But it's up to you how far you're willing to side with her. And if you don't side with her, she shows genuine regret of certain actions later down the line. Regardless of what you choose, there's always a strong sense of friendship that shines through. As the player, I was forming a bond with these characters and wanted the best for them. Not just the main characters, but there are a lot of well-developed side characters too. Or there were some a-holes I wish I could kick in the nuts. You would say that being able to rewind time kills the joy of making moral choices, since you can easily undo undesired outcomes. But personally, I feel this is mostly implemented in a great way. Often there are choices where the outcomes are in a gray area. No clear good or bad. Sometimes you have to think how the choice will play out in the long run. Will you make a choice that feels right in the moment but might backfire? Or will you do something shitty now for the chance that it might have a positive influence later in the story? In terms of downsides, at first I had a really hard time accepting the final chapter given it felt like there was a more fitting ending near the beginning of the chapter. But after multiple playthroughs, it grew more and more on me. One of the few games that hit me on an emotional level this hard, for its fantastic writing, lovable characters, and some tough moral dilemmas, Life is Strange offered me one of my favorite gaming experiences of the past decade. Number 5. Hellblade. Send you a sacrifice. In this story, you follow a sword fighter with mental health issues, who makes a journey to hell in order to save someone she loves. This game is all experienced from her point of view. What you get is a mind-bending experience with such a unique and artistic, but effective and immersive way of telling its story that it instantly became one of my favorites. Its colors, composition, pacing, sound and the overall feel. I haven't seen a single piece of entertainment that tells its story in the way Hellblade does. Granted, different and unique don't automatically equal good, but Hellblade isn't just different for the sake of standing out, but all these aspects are executed in an excellent, gripping way. Just like her, you get disoriented and confused at the lack of order in her world. Intimidated by the unpredictable dangers, irritated at the constant negative feedback of the voices in her head, I was completely emotionally involved in her story. This game removes your save file if you lose too many times, which made me extra stressful not to make mistakes. The combat is simple but very effective and satisfying. You can feel the brutal impact of every sword strike and it finds a right balance in difficulty. Never does it feel like a cakewalk, but I always felt like I could beat the challenges if I were careful enough. Visually, it's absolutely beautiful. How was this made by a small team? I could often lose myself in just exploring the scenery. The only real problem I have is that you have to search for shapes in the environment regularly. And I mean, about one third of this game is looking for shapes. This is way too dominant for something that isn't nearly as fun as the rest. Besides from that, I have no real problems. One of the most creative and powerful gaming journeys I've seen in the past decade. 
I just hope the sequel can live up to its predecessor. Number 4. Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, Spirit of Justice The story-driven franchise where you need to carefully analyze evidence and question suspects in order to unravel the many crazy mysteries this world offers. The latest entry in the series returns all the fun mechanics that were introduced in the previous installments like the Spirit Channeling, Psyche Locks, Apollo's Bracelet, the Mood Matrix, and it even introduces an awesome new mechanic, the Divination Seance. This is some sort of magical ritual that allows you to witness the last thing someone saw, smelt, and heard before they died. These are short videos where you need to carefully analyze every little detail that happens, thinking in clever ways how it contradicts your evidence. Maybe the order of the sound is off, there is an unusual smell, or maybe you just need to watch it a couple of times before you're able to spot something odd. Even the tiniest detail can make a difference. They made the clever decision to make a large portion of the story take place in another country where the laws work differently. Namely, lawyers get the same sentence as the accused, even if the penalty is death. That makes the weight of the trials heavier than ever before. It was very engaging to dive deeper into the politics of this country, the war between rebellions and the throne, and it could be straight up heart-wrenching to see how these laws negatively affected certain villagers. Even though it's a 3D game, the characters almost look 2D. They did such an outstanding good job at recreating the 2D feel with 3D models, it's almost scary. I can think of many games where 3D models were as expressive, energizing and cartoonish like in Spirit of Justice. This is arguably one of the best entries in the Phoenix Wright series, and I hope it's not the last we'll be seeing of this franchise. Number 3. Detroit Become Human Like I said in my previous video, and what is blatantly obvious in this video, Interactive drama is one of my favorite genres in gaming, but there hasn't been a single interactive drama game that impacted me as much as Detroit Become Human. Each playable character is an android with a clear purpose in the world, but all three of them end up in situations that conflict with their purpose. It asks interesting questions regarding whether these androids can be considered human or not, and whether they should or shouldn't get the same rights. He took a bat and started hitting me. For the first time, I felt scared. Scared he might destroy me, scared I might die. I knew they were machines, yet they felt like actual people I couldn't bring myself to let bad things happen to. What's also strong about Detroit Become Human is the way it informs you about the influence you have on the story. With heavy rain, you don't really know where you exactly have an impact unless you replay the game or look it up on the internet. Here, there's a flowchart at the end of every stage that shows you how many options you've had. This made getting a good outcome all the more satisfying, knowing fully I prevented a bad outcome. This game grabbed me from start to finish and didn't let go for a single second. Sure, there were some lesser chapters and lesser gameplay aspect, some characters that weren't that interesting, but the main story always kept me excited to continue, and it hit bullseye. In my opinion, this is the best interactive drama game ever made, and it's usually the one I recommend to start with, if you're interested in trying one. Number 2. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate In terms of the sheer fun factor of the gameplay, Super Smash has always been one of my favorite franchises. Ever since I played the first one for the Nintendo 64, I've been hooked and I want to play it regularly. From Melee to Brawl, even Project M to the 3DS, Wii U and now Ultimate for the Switch. The enthusiasm has always been strong. Smash works great as both an awesome party game as well as a highly competitive skill-based game. Normally when I play a game competitively online, I play it for around 30 minutes, maybe an hour, and then I'm done for a couple of days. This goes on for a month or so until I completely stop. But Super Smash? <laughs> oh no! I can play this for hours and hours on end almost every day. Something about the way it plays, the insanely huge library of characters, and how the majority of them play very differently make it a franchise I never seem to grow tired of. Unlike a traditional fighting game, Smash implements platform elements and the main goal is to get the opponent off stage. Any effective technique may not work anymore if the opponent is at high damage, 
or an effective technique may not work in other matchups. This means that you constantly need to adapt and change your approach, depending on the character you play, opponent's playstyle, stage, matchup, or the amount of damage the characters have. Making this one of the most diverse, flexible, addictingly fun, and rewarding competitive games I've ever played. And that's just the gameplay. The experience itself is a huge crossover celebration of gaming with an overwhelming amount of iconic video game faces. This game went up and beyond to make the most out of what it promises, and it fully delivers! Okay, 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 maybe not fully. The single player modes are rather forgettable and the online mode is rather lacking in content too. Even with a proper internet connection, you'll always have some lag, making it a downgrade from playing offline. However, I usually have a decent connection and I've learned to adapt to the lag. Controversially, I love the GSP system for how it matches you against opponents from around the same level. No more random hordes of beginners or opponents that greatly outmatch me, but usually I'm evenly matched regardless of the character I pick. This encourages me way more to play characters I don't pick often. Despite that online isn't as good as it should have been, I still enjoy to play it regularly. A whopping 6 new characters will join the roster soon. With that on the way and a very active community, Smash Ultimate isn't going to die anytime soon. And my favorite game, not just of the past decade, but of all time, is... Uncharted 3 – Drake's Deception. Uncharted describes a video game world I just need to experience once every couple of years. And when I do, I'm completely emerged and love every second of it. Something about these games I just can't seem to get enough of. The cheesy but really fun stories, the memorable characters, the compelling fictional mysteries based on historic events, the breathtaking, beautiful places you visit, from forests, swamps, war zones, snow mountains, deserts, peaceful villages and whatnot almost like I'm visiting friends that live in foreign countries every time I play through their franchise. The shooting system seems basic at first but works really darn well once you dive into it. Each plays experiments with different layouts, different lineups of enemies, or you have different weapons at your disposal, so you need to make the best out of what you have. The enemies often move around or throw grenades, so hiding at one spot usually isn't a viable technique. I still often lose in some levels due to how flexible the stages are designed. Uncharted has some of the best, if not the very best, action scenes ever to put in a game. Even after so many playthroughs, I still get goosebumps at the shipwreck sequence, the burning building, and oh my god, that freaking fight on a crashing plane is just insane! It's so damn good, man. But yeah, controversially, Part 3 is my favorite of the series, ignoring the fact that Part 1 and 2 were released before past decade. I feel like I should probably give an explanation as to why I went for 3 instead of 4, or why I would pick it over 2 regardless of the time it came out. The series as a whole has a serious, story-driven side. You lied to me. For weeks. If you were killed, I... I wouldn't have even known about it. And also a cheesy, action-driven side. Adios, asshole. but part 3 hits a perfect note in between. I feel like this is the perfect balance between both sides. It knew exactly when to give you moments to breathe or when to go insane. It has some of my favorite rest moments in all of gaming, combined with some of my favorite bombastic action sequences. I also love the focus of the story, seeing more of the bond between Nathan and Sully, learning how they met and how Sully became sort of the father Nathan never had. I also love that Nathan's obsession with hunting for treasure and pushing his limits was praised in the previous games, but here it's also presented as a flaw. Listen, you won, okay? You've outsmarted her. You know where to find the city, and Marlo doesn't. Why can't that be enough? With exception of the opening, maybe the pace never dragged on. Mix that with some awesome chase scenes, tough fist fights, horse riding action, exploring dark caves, and some mindfuck moments, and this is an amazing adventure I must re-experience every now and then. Uncharted 3 became my absolute favorite game of this last decade and of all time. <laughs> Perfect. Here we go. 
So, did you enjoy this video? Are there some other awesome games of the past decade you'd recommend others to check out? Thanks a lot for your time and interest, and until next time!